Welcome to the Summit for Wellness podcast, where we help you climb to the peak of your health. And now, here is your host, Brian Carroll. Have you decided that this will be the year you will have your own garden? There is nothing quite like having homegrown foods because the freshness and the taste is so much different than what you will find at the stores. And today, I want to help you have a successful harvest this summer. What's up, everyone? I'm Brian Carroll, and I'm here to help people move more, eat well, and be adventurous. And I have Melissa K. Norris joining me to walk through some tips and tricks to growing a beautiful garden. She has a ton of expertise on gardening and feeding entire families. And while sometimes gardening can seem complicated, she does a fantastic job of reassuring us that the best way of learning is by trial and error. Everyone's garden plot will be a little bit different, and you will learn what works best for your garden. And Melissa also has available an organic gardening workshop, which you can learn more about at summitforwellness.com slash gardening 101. So let's jump into my conversation with Melissa. Melissa K. Norris helps hundreds of thousands of people each month raise their own food and create a homemade and homegrown kitchen, home, garden, and barnyard through her website, popular Pioneering Today podcast, and the Pioneering Today Academy and her books. Melissa is a fifth-generation homesteader and lives with her husband and two kids in their own little house in the big woods in the foothills of the North Cascade Mountains. Thank you for coming on to the show, Melissa. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. I'm looking forward to it. Of course. And I'm really excited to chat with you because right now we are living in a a very interesting time where there could potentially be some food shortages coming up. People are starting to think more about, um, you know, where can I get food that are, you know, more local and better sourced and people are thinking about growing their own food. So that's why you are here. You're going to walk us through these different options. But before we dive into that, what is your background? And what got you so interested in homesteading? Okay, I'll try to keep this short and sweet. But I was raised, I'm a fifth generation homesteader. So I was raised by a homesteader, raised very rurally. In fact, I live, we purchased family property from my grandmother and I live on the same road where I grew up. And we always had cattle for meat. So we very rarely bought meat from the store. Occasionally, my mom would buy chicken and that was like a treat. And so I grew up on a cattle farm and we had a big garden and my mom canned during the summer months and she always cooked from scratch. And back then, I just thought that was normal. It wasn't until I was older that I realized it was actually out of necessity. We always had enough, but, you know, it was, uh, we just didn't have the money. Like oftentimes when we would go to town when I was little, uh, because we lived so rurally. So to go to like big grocery stores um, or to go to clothes stores, et cetera, we were driving like 45 minutes to an hour to hit like where Costco is now, though Costco when I was little. I sound so ancient. Back in my day, we didn't have a Costco up here. <laughs> but um, like my mom would pack my lunch in a brown bag and there were McDonald's and there were Burger Kings, et cetera. But she would pack our lunch and pack our snacks because we didn't have extra money to even go out to eat. But I didn't know I didn't know that's why. I just thought that was the way that I grew up. And I thought that's what everybody did, you know, until you get older. So I was very much blessed. I look at it now as a blessing to be raised in a home where we did so much that was self-sufficient and raising our own food and cooking our own food, et cetera. And then when I got out on my own and and got married and we started our family, I started working a, a day job and we had a garden but, and I cooked some from scratch, but it was more like buying box mixes of this and that. And then you mix it at home and put it in the oven and think you're cooking from scratch type type deal. And it was about 11 years ago now that my health really started to suffer. Um, I was in my late twenties at that time and had just had my second child, which was my daughter. And I had really bad GERD and stomach ulcers to the point that I was taking prescription medications six times a day, max doses. And I had to have my stomach and esophagus biopsy because I actually thought that I might have cancer. It was so severe. So long story short, I had to completely overhaul our food. Um, and that was how I found healing and was able to get off the medications and everything else. And in order to find that healing and to get food, we had to grow it 
ourself at that time to be able to find now even, gosh, I still, it's that old thing, you know, 10 years now, we have so much more available to us in the stores that is organic. It is pasture raised. It is non-GMO certified. We actually have really seen, I have seen on the store shelves, a big growth and expansion of healthier food. It's not I, where it, by any means where I hope it should be. I hope it grows a lot more. Um, but we had to raise it ourselves in order for us to be able to afford it and or for me to find it at that time where I lived. So we started raising all of our own meat. Um, I do still occasionally buy extra bacon or ribs because you only get so much of that per animal when you're butchering once a year. Um, but we raise 75% of our own fruits and over 50% of our vegetables for our family of four for a year. So I tried to make that concise, but that's my story. So uh, going back, you, did I hear you say that chicken used to be a treat for you when you were growing up? Yeah. we. So at that time, my dad, we didn't raise chickens. We didn't have chickens for eggs or chickens for meat, but we we had beef cattle. And so we had, which is probably the opposite of a lot of homes, but growing up, we ate a lot of beef and occasionally we would have fish, but we didn't raise chicken. And so that was a meat source we had to buy. And so, yeah, chicken was actually like a, a treat and a luxury. It was something that we didn't have very often. <laughs> <laughs> I'm laughing at that because chicken is like one of the easiest ones to get started with. And it doesn't yeah. take very long for meat birds to get to full size. So, <laughs> yeah, you know, I think what it was is, is my dad was self-employed. He was a logger um, in the, and he had his own uh, log trucks. And then the cattle was something that he didn't have to feed during the summer months because we always did grass. We, we never did grain fed. Um, so during the summer and spring months, he didn't have to feed them. It wasn't like a daily maintenance thing. And then butchering was just once a year. And so for him, he was getting up and leaving at like 3, 4 a.m. in the morning. He'd get home at like 6 at night, have to grease and work on the trucks and then just go to bed. So the chickens was a daily thing that he didn't want to deal with, though I know a lot of people, yes, definitely consider chickens like the gateway and can be a quick way without a lot of land to get some meat. Well, as we start diving into this, um, before we dive into the easy ways to get started with gardening and growing your own food, can you give us a couple mistakes that people make when they first get started? Yes. So when people first get started, especially with gardening, uh, there's a couple of common mistakes. And one of those is you get really excited, like we tend to do when we start something new. We're like pumped up and jazzed. And seed packets and seeds and even little starts, they're really tiny when you first put them all in. And so people have a tendency to way over plant. And so then they get really overwhelmed. So then all of this stuff starts coming on and then there's the weeding and the care for it. And then hopefully it all starts producing and they're like, oh my gosh, like, what do I do with all of this? Um, and so oftentimes people try to go too big, too fast, which I know in, in these times with COVID, when a lot of us are focusing more on being self-sufficient, that's not necessarily a bad thing or a mistake. And, and this year might be a year where I would actually recommend, well, maybe go, you know, don't scale back, go ahead and go a little bit bigger. Um, but the other probably bigger things beyond that that I see is people not planting things at the right time. Uh, so for example, people really like to go by gardening zone. People will hear gardening zone thrown out a whole bunch. And your gardening zone is based upon your average low temperatures during the winter months by where you live. So they take those average lows and then usually in about 10 degree increments, it's going to change from gardening zone six to gardening zone seven, et cetera. So gardening zones are really important to know when you are growing perennial. So if you're putting in fruit trees um, or a lot of your different flowering garden perennial plants that come back every year to know that they will survive through that cold winter temperatures to be able to survive and come back the next year. However, when it comes to an annual vegetable garden, your gardening zone doesn't really have anything to do with when you should be planting. That's all based on your first and last average frost dates. And so a big mistake that I see is people see someone who's in gardening zone six and they're in gardening zone six, which you can be in totally different states and still be in the same gardening zone. And they'll see this person is planting. And so they think, oh, that means I should plant now too. Um, but it's those frost dates. So knowing your first and last frost dates and planting according to those by the type of plants that you're putting in is much more important than trying to go by gardening zone for planting dates. Um, the other thing I see is 
this is really true for the foundation and the health of your entire garden is your soil health. And so most of the time when people are having issues with their plants, so they they get them in and they're starting to grow and then maybe some issues start to crop up like uh, yellowing leaves or they're just not starting to produce or the plants seem to be, be really struggling is soil health. And so one of the common mistakes that I see people make especially when it comes to like container gardening, which is great because anybody, even if you don't have a big yard, you can grow something in pots. Like anybody can, I, I still grow things in pots and we have acreage, um, but people get confused. They hear about compost and compost is wonderful addition to your soil. Compost um, brings in a lot of good organic matter. It can help with drainage. If you have hard compact clay, it can bring in macro and micronutrients, which our plants need, but compost is not the same thing as soil. So if you try to plant in just straight compost, then it the plant is not going to grow very well um, it's not going to have all the nutrients it needs and it will likely get really waterlogged and be too damp and you're going to deal with a lot of mold and a lot of fungal issues. So compost is awesome and amazing, but when it's mixed in with actual soil is where the magic really happens. So I think those are probably the biggest mistakes that I see off the bat. So for someone just getting started, those mistakes could be a little overwhelming, right? Trying to figure out the soil, trying to figure out the frost, and trying to figure out how much to actually plant and not overplant. So what are some easy ways that aren't so scary to get someone started with gardening? Yeah, so some really the simple, one of the easiest ways that I like to get started is Herbs are a great way to go, especially if you have a small amount of space. And most herbs aren't super picky, um, especially things like basil is a great one. It's pretty easy to grow anything in the mint family. Um, but with your herbs, putting them in containers, especially anything in the mint family, <laughs> because they like to spread like crazy. So I like to say yes, when you're starting with herbs, going in containers, like I don't feel like you can go wrong with putting herbs in containers, lavender, rosemary, sage, like you name it, I've pretty much growing it, grown that herb in a container. And so when you're doing containers, the biggest thing is making sure that whatever container you plant it in has a drain hole. I have no idea why when you go to garden centers, I don't know why the manufacturers do not always put drain holes in pots because you absolutely have to have them. It's kind of a pet peeve of mine. I'm like, put the drain holes in the pots, please. <laughs> uh, but not all of them do. So it's easy. You could get a drill. You can even take like a nail and a hammer as long as it's not like pottery, right? Terracotta. Um, if it doesn't have a drain hole in it, but make sure that it has some drain holes in there. That's an absolute must if it doesn't come with them in there already. And then second is when you're dealing with your containers is you can just purchase, make sure it says potting soil. Um, is what you want when you're going in a container. So that's important because with your containers, you don't have gravity and metric pressure working. We still have gravity because we're on the earth, but it's not the same as when you have in-ground soil and the way that it pulls the moisture through. Um, and if you try to just go out to the garden and or just out in the ground and just dig up dirt that's in the ground and put it in a container, oftentimes it will compact and it won't drain right. And so you'll kill the plant, you'll have a lot of, it'll really struggle and have issues. Um, so actually getting container potting soil is really the best way to go drain holes. And then just putting your plants in there, uh, making sure if it's something that's deep rooted, which you don't really get to a whole lot with herbs, especially when they're small, um, is that the pot is large enough to support the root system. So if it was something like a tomato plant that actually has a very expansive root system, you'd want to make sure you got a really large pot, um, like five gallons or larger per tomato plant. Um, but when we're talking things like basil and rosemary, uh, lavender, even oregano, thyme, they don't have these big, huge root systems. So you're, you're pretty good to go. Um, for potting soil, would you use potting soil for raised beds as well or just for pots? That is a great question, and it's going to depend on your definition of raised bed. So the reason I bring this up is because in literally in my book, The Family Garden Plan, but also in my book, like, like the way I define a raised bed, is a raised bed does not have a bottom. You merely, merely have 
structures on the side that allow you to go deeper. And so there is no bottom to it. Whereas in a container, we obviously there, there's going to be a bottom to there because sometimes people will build what looks like a raised bed, but it'll actually have a bottom in it. So in my book, that's still a container. So a raised bed that just has um, structure on the sides, but not on the underneath and the ground part that the plants can still go down into the native soil for raised beds, um, then you can use whatever type of dirt you want. You don't have to buy potting soil particularly because potting soil is formulated with usually um, perlite or some different things so that it doesn't get too compact and it helps with the moisture retention to keep things even because you don't have that gravitational force. But with a raised bed that the bottom is open to the ground, then you do have that gravitational force um, still at work there and, and that it will pull things down and, and help with drainage. So um, with that type with the raised beds in that instance, you don't have to purchase formulated potting soil, but you can use potting soil. You can bring in topsoil. Kind of depends on how large your raised beds are and how many you're doing and what's going to be the best economical choice for you. Um, some people will choose to have uh, topsoil brought in and then they'll mix like some compost with that um, or they'll fill them with some partial with garden dirt and then mix in some compost and that, et cetera. So those are a little bit different. Uh, you have a little bit more availability choice-wise to you on the dirt with raised beds. And then going back to the pots that have herbs and starting out with herbs, do you want to have those positioned in a, a specific place on your property? Do you want them to get a lot of light, not much sunlight, medium light, or does it depend on the plants that you're planting? Great question. It can depend on the plants that you're planting. Most of your herbs are going to require six hours of full sun. Now, there are some that tend to like hotter temps than others. So for example, basil uh, really does well in really warm temperatures, whereas like your sage and your mint, things like lemon balm, anything that's in the mint family, um, they will be okay if they're in a little bit more partial shade. So they still are going to require some full sunlight. They're not going to really do well in absolute full shade. They're going to kind of struggle and you're not going to get a, a really big harvest off of them. It's going to take them a lot longer to produce. Um, but you can have them where they get morning and early afternoon sun and then are shaded in the late afternoon, early evening, and they'll do fine as long as they're getting about six hours of sunlight. Perfect. And so we started with herbs. We're doing really well. We're getting more brave. We want to go uh, bigger with our harvest. What are the next best plants to start with to provide uh, more food for the table. Yeah. So if you're really looking at getting more food on the table, we're going to be picking plants that produce more than one thing of harvest, which might sound kind of weird. But when you think about like a beet, you think about an onion, um, you think about a carrot per seed, you're getting one beet. Well, beet seed technically is a cluster of seeds. So you will thin them to one beet, but <laughs> you're going to be getting per beet plant one beet, right? one carrot, et cetera. So if you're really looking to get food on the table, you're going to want to look at things that produce multiple points of harvest. So for example, zucchini, we know zucchini are super prolific. It's kind of like a joke in the gardening world. Um, you know, in the summertime, people will sneak zucchini on your porch. Don't leave your cars unlocked, your car windows down. You're going to come and find zucchini because zucchini are, are typically very prolific and for most people. <laughs> so, so things like that, where you're getting a lot of a lot of harvest off of one plant. So your summer squash, so for zucchini, um, you know, patty pan, crook neck, and then cucumbers are another one. And even your winter squash, you don't get quite as many winter squash per plant as you would as a, a summer squash, but you're still going to get multiple pumpkins, uh, multiple butternut, multiple acorn, you know, all those fun things. So squash are a great, great way to go both winter and summer. Uh, your bean plants and specifically a pole bean will give you more pounds per plant than a bush bean variety because it's going to grow taller. Obviously, it's going to need a structure. So you've got got to provide that for it. Uh, but you're going to get a lot of beans per plant. Um, peas are another one that are great. Uh, tomatoes, of course, you're going to get hopefully a lot of tomatoes off of one plant. Um, and I still grow, of course, carrots and beets and all those fun things and, you know, even cabbage and broccoli. But if you're really looking to put a lot of food on the table, those other options are going to provide more for you per square foot. And on a lot of those type of plants, are you able to 
harvest typically all summer long or does it depend on when they are ready to harvest? Yeah, great question. So there is a little bit of variety dependent. So for example, with your tomatoes, well, there's a ton of varieties when it comes to tomatoes, which makes them really fun to grow, but you've got determinate and indeterminate varieties. So usually your indeterminate varieties are the ones that really will vine and you're going to need a lot uh, more heavy duty support for them in the form of tomato cages or trellising, et cetera. They'll vine up, they'll get really tall. But those will also produce until they get killed by your first frost in the fall. So once they start producing, they're going to produce pretty much all summer long for you. Whereas your determinate varieties, usually you're just going to get a harvest for a maybe a two to three week window and they don't reach as tall. So if you don't have a support system or you're like, I, I don't have room to you know build a support system, or I don't want to deal with that. Determinate varieties can be a great way to go for that instance. Um, but typically your harvest window is quite a bit shorter. Now, when it comes to your beans and your peas and your squashes, especially summer squash, I should say, for most growing areas of the country, even though we call it a winter squash, it will be killed by a frost. So it's a warm weather annual, um, but they're not really ready to harvest until right at the fall at, when around that frost time. And then they'll store through the winter in like a root cellar or a basement pantry type environment, um, whereas your summer squash won't. <laughs> it's it's not going to you know keep very well. It's going to rot very fast if you try to do that. So that's a little bit of a difference there. But the summer squash, the more you pick from it, then the more flowers it will produce and therefore the more squash you will get. So that's the advantage I would say on summer squash is you can get more of a harvest throughout the summer months um, than you can with the winter squash, but the winter squash is going to store for you. And then with your beans and your peas, same thing. Once those flowers then form into the beans and you pick them, then the plant will produce more blossoms, which is therefore more beans and or peas for you so that you can harvest off of it pretty much all summer. The only thing, especially for your bean plants, peas as well, is when you hit really hot summer temps. So for me in the Pacific Northwest, this rarely happens and doesn't really have much effect on me. But if you live in a more warm Southern state and your temperatures get above 90 degrees and you're kind of averaging 90 to 100 degrees Fahrenheit for you know weeks on end, then the flowers don't actually set fruit. So during the heat of summer, the bean plants won't necessarily die. They just might not be producing any fruit for you. They'll fl the blossoms will form, but they won't actually form into beans. Um, but then once your attempts start to cool back down, then those blossoms will start. So if you live in a really hot southern state where that happens, a lot of times people will choose instead to plant their beans in the fall because they're not getting those early frosts like I have here um, and in the earlier part of summer in the spring through the summer months. And they take kind of that middle summer part off from those crops. And you had mentioned um, one of the squashes being able to store longer in the winter. And I know a lot of the the foods that we've been talking about they don't really store, they spoil unless you figure out how to use them or can them or whatever. Yeah. Um, so can you talk about different plants that uh, are really good for that long-term st long storage? Yes. So I will say to get the long-term storage on these plants, you do need to cure them. And I'll, I'll walk you through those steps too, but I want to preface it with that. So onions, garlic, um, pumpkin, spaghetti squash, acorn and a butternut squash are all ones that I personally have experienced and have tested on the storing methods. Now, like um, there's Hubbard, there's other varieties of winter squash that would do the same, should follow the same principles and you should have the same success with. I just personally have not grown those. So just to preface with that, this is the ones that I, I've had pretty extensive experience with. So with your onions and your garlic, you want to pull those from the garden. So when they're ready to harvest, which for me is typically mid-July through August, and then you want to cure them. So the process of curing, same thing with those winter squash. Um, when you're picking them, you want to make sure that you are leaving the stem 
on if you want to do long-term storage. Uh, the reason for that is the stem is going to help prevent oxygen from getting into the plant and breaking it down faster is the reason for that. So make sure that you pick them with the stem on. Or if you're going like a local farmer's market or a you pick farm, keep the stem on or pick the ones that have the stem on. Then you want to cure them. So the curing process is where we are putting them not in direct sunlight. So we have a covered back porch that has uh, will reach warm temperatures, not direct sunlight, so it doesn't burn them, um, and really good airflow. And so you're going to be curing them ideally at 85 degrees Fahrenheit or warmer for about two to three weeks. And you will see on your garlic and your onion, onions that those green stems at the top, they're going to dry, they're going to wither, and they'll also start to form, you know, the skins, which we see onion skins all the time at the store. And it's, you know, the outer skin is nice and dry and usually it's brown. Um, so that's what we're looking for. On the winter squash, um, spaghetti squash is another one. And I have to say, actually, spaghetti squash has the longest storage shelf life for me um, once it's been cured just in the on my kitchen shelves and on the pantry floor um but you are wanting any little nicks to be hardened up you'll see the outer rind of it is going to get harder so when you like press your fingernail against it it's not as soft and it, it becomes hard and then the stems that we have left on are going to be more brown more withered more dry so that's the purpose of us curing it is to really dry everything out. But then because heat is the enemy of long-term food storage, right? So we use our fridge and freezer. After that time period, then you want to move them into a cool environment. So ideally in root cellar situations, they were kept a about between 40 and 50 degrees, 55 degrees Fahrenheit with a specific amount of humidity. Um, I don't have a basement and I don't have a garage and I don't have a, a real root cellar. So I have been able to, in our back pantry, which doesn't have any um, outdoor windows, it was actually the like the cleaning closet and we converted it to a back pantry. And it's the furthest away from our heat source. So we use a wood heat, uh, wood, excuse me, wood stove is our heat source. And that room is the furthest away from that wood stove. So it stays relatively cool, usually about in the low 60s throughout the winter months back there and no light. Um, I'm able to keep, I still have spaghetti squash that I harvested and cured last September. And at the time of this recording, it is June and it is still good. Um, pumpkins and acorn squash, I have had go as far as the end of January from harvesting in September. And I still have onions and garlic will go a full year for me doing doing these techniques. Um, so, but really that, that curing time is really essential. And I will say here in the Pacific Northwest, by the time we hit September and even the end of August, I don't always have a full two weeks of 85 degree Fahrenheit weather. So if it's cooler than that, then I just need to extend it. It may take me one or two more weeks longer for them to get cured and dried out. And there have been times where I've actually just had to bring them in next to the wood stove to get warm enough to finish drying out. But then after they've reached that curing part and they're dried, it's really key that you try to get them into as cool of environment as possible. That's not the fridge, but yeah, and dark. Yeah, I was going to ask how you do it up here in the Pacific Northwest because it's not often we get two weeks of 85. No, no, it's very <laughs> rare, actually. It's very rare. And so I'll try to time it like you look at the weather forecast and you're praying that the weatherman actually got it accurate for the next coming week. And I'll try to time it so that when they're, they are ready to be harvested, of course. So I, um, for onions and garlic, especially if it's soft neck garlic, the stems will all begin to fall over and the same thing uh, with your onions. So when the stems start to lay towards the ground, I know that the bulbs are then ready to be harvested. If it's hard neck garlic, the stems will never fall over, but the top um, like three or four leaves will start to turn brown and wither. So that's your sign. And then you can pull one and see how big the bulb is. And that's your real test, but those are your visual signs. So once those signs start to happen with the first ones, I'm like checking the, the extended weather forecast and looking for when we're going to have at least, you know, hopefully five days of sun in a row, which sometimes happens, um, and then harvesting them right at the beginning of that period. But then sometimes it's three weeks that I have to let them go and I have had to finish them off in the house. So yeah, there's workarounds. Um, but if you live in warmer parts of the country, then uh, you, you'll be lucky. You will have a lot shorter curing period than I do. <laughs> yeah. And just like you, um, we harvested our spaghetti squash back in September. I did not cure it because I didn't know that was a thing. And uh, we still have some. And 
like you said, it's June right now when we're recording, and we still have actually quite a few that have not rotted out or anything, so that are still good. Yeah, so isn't that those amazing? Definitely store. Yeah, they store really well. Yeah, I I have to say, spaghetti squash have been the best. They have went the longest for me um, without having any of them go bad or starting to show, you know, any any soft spots, etc. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, they're amazing, and they taste really good too. Um, so going back to the plants that aren't very good for long-term storage. Do you have any strategies on how to still have access to those type of foods all year long? Yeah. So we use multiple ways of food preservation here on the homestead for those crops. And so canning is one that I use a lot of just because we put up so much food that there's no way I could have enough deep chest freezers to store it all, you know, for our family of four to take us through if I were to just try to use the freezing method. Um, We also lose power quite a bit. (laughs) So I like to know that my food storage is not dependent upon the electricity being on, though we do have chest freezers and I do have meat in the freezer and a few vegetables that don't lend themselves well uh, to canning or other forms of food preservation. So, um, but I like to do a lot of canning. So pressure canning, the non-acidic foods, which unless you are pickling your vegetables, that's going to be all of your vegetables um, will need to be pressure canned. Of course, your fruits and pickles though, and tomatoes uh, with added acid can safely be water bath canned. So I do quite a bit of canning, but I also do uh, dehydrating and fermenting. So I, with the fermentation, I am limited because I don't have a basement or a garage that really stays cool enough for long-term fermented storage. Um, so I do do up half gallons of quite a few of our different favorite ferments and then just keep them in the fridge. Uh, and they will last if we don't go through them that fast. It depends on how fast we go through them. Um, I've had, um, I had one jar of, um, sauerkraut that was, I think, nine months old before we eat the very last of it. Um, And so they'll last for a really long time, your ferments, once they get moved into the fridge. And again, like if the power goes out and you have a ferment in the fridge, it's going to be fine if it gets up to room temperature. It's just the longer it stays at room temperature, um, the more it's going to ferment. And if it stays at room temperature for too long where it's warm, then it can develop mold. Most of the time it just gets super tangy though, more so than we actually like. Um, But dehydration can be another great way to go. And it really depends for me on how I know we eat that food, you know, in what format and how we, we like it the best and that and safety wise as well as how I decide what type of preservation I'm going to be using per crop. Have you ever done freeze drying? I haven't just, I'll be honest, the, cost of the freeze dryer, uh, the maintenance and the space. So we live in a a manufactured home. And again, I don't, I don't have a garage and I don't have a basement. And um, so I don't really know where I would store it and where I would be able to run it without uh, it being like in the middle of the kitchen, which is where I do all of, you know, I'm in the corner of my kitchen doing my podcast and all my videos and everything and knowing that that thing is sitting there running. I'm just not sure how it would make it work. Freeze drying can be great. I have friends that freeze dry and love it. It's just not one I've personally jumped into yet. We do it a lot for backpacking food. That way we can control what we actually eat compared to what you buy in the store. Yeah. Um, but we do do some of some of what we harvest. We'll freeze dry it for storage for later too. So do you find that the machine is noisy or that big or is that like over exaggeration? It's it's noisy. Um, I do know some people that have theirs inside. We have ours in the garage and we can't hear it um, inside when it's going in the garage. But um, it'd probably be equivalent to like a washer or dryer that's going. Okay. But it's going for like 36 hours. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, I yeah, till we get a garage or a barn or something out shed that it, it would be safe and I, I think I'm going to have to hold off. Though I am very intrigued by them, but that's just so that's just the reason that we haven't dived into that. Yeah. So I know there's a lot of people that live more inner city. They don't really have much room to grow on. Is there different ways to still grow food in a very small or minimal space? Yeah. So if you're in our city, there's, there's a couple different options, honestly. So there's community gardens, which some cities and some communities will have and some won't. So I would say like, look in, look into that. If you're wanting to do more than, you know, what you feel 
your yard or if you don't have a yard, what your maybe your balcony or your patio, et cetera, will allow. Um, so community gardens can be a great way to go. But otherwise is to do vertical gardening and vertical plants. So there are vertical stackable containers that actually stack and they'll go up like five feet tall right on top of each other that you can use. I actually have one, we have all of our space, but I grow my strawberries and that to keep the slugs and the snails out of them on my on our back patio. Um, and it works really great over winters, et cetera. Um, and then again, like in your, in your containers um, is putting you know, trellises in there and putting supports in or going up fences or if like you have a balcony um, or even a porch railing, you know, put a container at the, the bottom of where one of your posts are and your porch fits in full sun and planting a, a pea or a pole bean or even a cucumber. Um, you could trellis, you know, a cucumber because the cucumbers themselves aren't as big as like, say, a pumpkin, etc. So those are going to be easy for you to trellis. Um, if you've got arbors, maybe coming into your yard or your walkway, instead of doing a climbing rose, you could do grapes or a kiwi, um, you know, anything that is a, is a climbing and vining plant like that can be easy ways to just kind of tuck food in to those different spots. Um, if you do have a railing or some type of balcony, they make the planters that hook right over there and you can grow really easily like a lot of the shallower rooted plants like and that are fast growing too, really like lettuce, um, the little breakfast radishes, um, many, almost all of your leafy herbs and like Swiss chard, you know, those types of things. They don't have big root systems. They don't require, you know, a ton of support. So those can be easy to grow. And again, like with the herbs that we talked about, those are some of my favorites, but you really can get, most people can get pretty creative um, and putting in, even if it's just different raised beds and planters here and there, and you can tuck quite a bit in even to landscaping. You know, you can get some of the, the purple, all the different beautiful cabbages, like there's the purple cabbage and the red cabbage and all those different things. And you can even sneak, even with it, if you have strict HOAs, I know some people deal with, with um, pretty strict HOAs and they can't do like a vegetable garden in their front yard, but you can get kind of sneaky <laughs> and plant quite a few things in with more traditional landscaping plants uh, that are edible. I would not want to be in that HOA that can't let you grow food. Oh, I mean, yeah, yeah. No, same here. <laughs> no way. Let's get those changed. If you're in one, like figure out a way to get those rules changed. <laughs> yeah, especially now. Like now's the time to push for that. Yeah. You both, and, and maybe have success because they would be thinking the same thing. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Um, have you ever tried hydroponics before? You know, I have not. Well, okay. Let me, let me, let me go back on this. I have not done hydroponics in the way that most people think. I have grown basil in a mason jar with water and a little bit of silica. Um, it had it had fairly good results, but I haven't done like big hydroponics for the majority of our crops just because we are here in the Pacific Northwest and I have the space and I have the soil and it, you know, it's good soil without having to do a ton of amending to it, just some compost and aged manure once a year. So I just haven't delved into hydroponics. Yeah. I forget what the method is called, the crack key method or something with the mason jar. Um, but we did quite a few starts this year and then transfer them to the garden. And actually, for the most part, it worked out better than I, I expected. Did it? Did you have to put any uh, air? Did you have to do any air stone stuff with them or not? Um, no. Um, like in the ground or in the water Sorry, itself? In the water itself when you were when you were doing the starts <laughs> in the, in the, oh, yeah, in the yeah, hydroponic. Yeah. So yeah. Yep. Um, so uh, we didn't add any air. What we did do is uh, we had, I forget what they're, the little starters that you can put seeds in. Mm -hmm. And then we had that surrounded by clay rocks. And then all of that was submerged and they would grow from there. Okay. Okay. Oh, cool. Yeah. And then um, what we discovered is the more established the plant was, the worse it was trying to transplant it into the garden. Um, because the root systems were too established and being in water, they're not as hardy as what they would be in, in soil. And so the younger, the younger sprouts, um, putting those into soil, they thrived. They just took off because they weren't so accustomed to not having to dig. That makes sense. Yeah. Cause it's a very different medium from, yeah, being water fed and then going into the ground. So, oh, that's cool. I love it when people do experience though. I love, like my whole garden and homestead is a total experience. I split test stuff all the time. I just, I guess it's like the geeky nerdy science part of me comes out and I think it's super fun. <laughs> 
Yep. Yeah, even when you know, like, if I do my garden this way, I know it's going to produce a lot of food, but I still want to try something different and see if this works as well. Yeah. That's kind of what we do. Yeah. Yeah. That's a fun experiment. Well, good to know, though. Good to know <laughs> if you try that, do it sooner. Do your timing so that they're not having to spend too much time in the water medium before they go in the ground. Yep, exactly. And then... um are there different types of companion plants that you like to put in your garden that, or, um, you know, companion plants to help get rid of pests or they're either um, basically a decoy so that pests eat them instead of the main plants or what do you do for that? Yeah, so I love companion planting. Um, it's a lot of fun. It can feel really overwhelming to some people when they first hear about companion planting. So I'm going to start with my my basic absolute favorites. So one of the First ones that I love to put in is dill. And oftentimes people don't even really think about dill being a companion plant because dill is a great herb. If you're growing cucumbers or doing dilly beans or any type of pickling, you probably are growing some dill. Um, but dill is actually a great companion plant. And the reason that dill is such a good companion plant is because it attracts a lot of the good predatory insects. And I know a lot of times when we think of gardening, we don't always think that there's good and bad bugs. Um, but your dill is can be a great attractant and it can help attract ladybugs and ladybugs like to eat aphids. And so you'll often see common advice where people will say to just bring ladybugs into the garden. But if you don't have plants established for those ladybugs, they are just not going to hang out. They're not going to stay around and we need them to stay around in order to eat the aphids, obviously. So I really like to do dill, plus I'm going to be using it. Um, it's a food source too, right? So it's not just a, a, a plant that's good for companion-wise, but it's also a great food source. So dill is one of my top ones, and I just let dill self-seed kind of all over the garden, honestly. And then if it's in the way, I just pull it up. But most of the time, I just kind of let it go willy-nilly everywhere. Um, some of my other favorites is orange nasturtium. So Nasturtiums are a great companion plant, but when I was doing a lot of the research for my book, The Family Garden Plan, because I have a companion chart in here um, that walks through it all, we were really looking at not just anecdotal or what I've experienced or kind of like stuff that's been handed down, you know, like in, I don't want to say gardening myth, but so there's certain things that's handed down, you know, from generation or gardeners, you hear it around all the time. But I was really looking at some scientific studies that would have some proof, like why or, you know, in a, in a study study setting did this work. And all of them said that orange nasturtium showed the best results to helping repel the cabbage moth. So if you've ever grown brassicas before, so cabbage, broccoli, you know that the little moth that lays those little worms that tend to love <laughs> eating our cabbage and broccoli, and I don't like sharing with them, um, planting orange nasturtium can help repel them. So I plant orange nasturtium amidst, plus it's edible. So nasturtiums are a peppery, great addition to any salad or green that you got going on. So they're edible as well as pretty. Um, but I intersperse them with my Brussels sprouts and my broccoli and my cabbage, and it doesn't eradicate all. So it's not like you're going to plant them and you're never going to see a cabbage moth again. I wish I could tell you that was true, but it's not. But it definitely, definitely cuts down on the amount that I have. So I, it significantly has reduced the amount of damage I have from cabbage moths um, by putting them in it. Usually what I do, plus nasturtium seeds are super cheap. And then if you let them flower and go to seed, then you can just seed save them. So I seed save my nasturtium seed every year. Um, but I usually will do one nasturtium in between about every two to three plants. Um, so it's, it's in there pretty decently in between them. Um, but I would say those are probably my, like my top two go-tos that I have everywhere. Um, I will say though, I forgot to mention with the dill, um, that it does really well with the brassicas, corn, cucumber, lettuce, and onions. Um, but a lot of um, gardeners say not to plant it near carrots and tomatoes. When I was doing my research, the main reason it said not to plant it near carrots is when you, if you let your carrots go the second year um, into flowering so that you actually get seeds, if you're going to be seed saving, that they will, they can cross. Some sources said that and then other sources said, no, they actually won't cross. So if you want to be on the safe side, 
just pull your dill up away from your carrots um, and don't grow them near one another. But yeah, the orange nasturtium and the dill are probably my two biggest, biggest ones. And the nasturtium also helps to repel um, white flies and beetles as well. Hmm. Do you have any tricks for slugs and snails? <laughs> Oh, <laughs> those slugs and snails. Um, so honestly, it's probably going to sound gross, but handpicking them things off is really like the most surefire way. So what I what I do, because common myth, eggshells do not, for the love, eggshells do not repel slugs. At least they never have. Maybe I have super sleuth slugs. I don't know. But eggshells has never kept slugs off of my plants. <laughs> um, a lot of studies have just shown that they're just not sharp enough. So I will use food grade DE, except living in the Pacific Northwest, as soon as it rains, it inactivates it. And so it's like almost pointless to apply it here. <laughs> so it's really hand picking. I go out in the early morning. And I have a little container with uh, soapy water in it. It has to have soap in it because I didn't know that when I first started. And I put slugs in a pail of water and they just climb right out. They don't drown. Just just FYI. Ooh. Yeah. You, you have to have okay. some soap in there to kill them. Unless you want to just smash them with your foot. That's up to you. I, I don't know why. I feel better just putting them in the soapy water. So I just go out in the morning and I hand pick them off. Um, you can like, if they're on a leaf, you can kind of like shake them in there. But there's been some I've just had to pluck and put in there in the soapy water. And of course, just wash your hands well afterwards. So um, really just doing that and being really diligent, especially in the beginning of the season when it is really cool and rainy, or if you have a really like it's been dry and then you have a rainy day, like do it that rainy day, that first rainy day after a dry spell. And the first couple of days you'll do it, like I will have a whole bunch, but I've been handpicking now. I think I'm on like week three from when our plants and everything in the slugs really came out. And like now, you know, I might go a couple of days checking in the morning and I won't find one. And then, you know, the next day I'll find like one or two. Whereas before they were literally like they decimated three broccoli plant in like one night. Like I came out the next morning and they had totally ate them all up. So I wish I had like a fast and easy, this is going to keep slugs and snails away, but I don't. <laughs> it always seems like they show up right when things are ready for harvest too. Yes. It's like, okay, tomorrow I'm going to pick this and then you wake up and boom, there they are. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that's why I feel like, especially early in the season, doing the hand picking, that way they're not breeding, you know, so you're, you're knocking it back for later, later in the season, hopefully. Um, at least that that's my theory. So, yeah. Yeah, we've used uh, DE before as well. But, um, yeah, coming back to the rain and the water, um, you know, we figured it would just wash it away or it's, it would make it useless. So um, with that, for watering purposes, are you using some type of sprinkler system or are you watering down at the, the base of the plants or how do you water your garden? Great question. So we use a couple different methods, honestly, um, for my tomatoes and my peppers here where we live in the Pacific Northwest. Plus, we're up in the northern, um, really in the foothills of the Cascade Mountains. So we'll have where a town 30 minutes from us will be sunny and I'll drive home and we'll be raining. So we, we get a lot of rain. And the only way I've successfully been able to grow tomatoes without having blight is to grow them in a high tunnel undercover all summer long. So for them, because I don't want to deal with blight and I went through the work of putting them under this high tunnel, I use soaker hoses and I don't have them on a timer. I just go out and I put my finger down in the soil. And if it's dry to the first knuckle, then I go ahead and water and I do a deep watering, um, this time of year, only once a week in like August when we are a little bit drier and warmer, usually about twice a week. Um, so for those, I use a soaker hose. For the other part of the garden, really, I usually only have to water maybe the end of July through August. So pretty short period of time, really. Um, but we do have a big overhead sprinkler that I just go and turn on um, in the early morning or the evening. I prefer to do early morning. So that way, the sun comes up and dries it off the leaves to help keep down any type of powdery mildew, et cetera, on like the squash plants. Um, but sometimes it gets done in the evening too. So I use a combination of both, but I, it's just 
we put a like a six or an eight foot um, T post in the center of the garden. And then we wire one of the big, the sprinklers, you know, that circulate all the way around and go in a full circular oscillating, I think would be the correct term. Um, and then I just hook my hose to it. So I don't have like a sprinkler irrigation system that's like permanently in the ground. Oh, yeah, that sounds like a really good system. Um, I've heard before, and I don't know if this is true, if you water at night, then that could shock the plants and um, do some bad stuff to them. Have you heard that before? I've heard it. Or is that just a... I've heard it, but I've never experienced it, to tell you the truth. Um, because but if I start... So, this, you know, the sun goes starts to go down and, and it starts to cool off. And so usually if I'm in a water at night, I'll start at like 7 p.m., and, you know, it still could be like, depending on the day, it could still be in the 70s, maybe low 80s if it's really, really hot out. But I have never experienced, now maybe if you live like in Arizona where it's like 100 to 110, that may be a different story. But I personally have never experienced any issues. Well, Melissa, uh, do you have any final uh, little tips or tricks that you want to share with us on how to be successful with growing your own garden? Yeah, you know, there's there's lots of like best practices, honestly. I mean, and we've shared quite a few of them here today, but really it's just to get the seed or the start and plant it and get growing because you will learn and it is good to do our research and find out, oh, this plant is not going to survive a frost. So I don't want to plant it too early in the season or too late, etc. Like there are some good things that you do need to know in some bases, but honestly, the you're going to just learn the best by doing and experimenting. I mean, you've heard from both me and Brian, like we, we test things out. And so just get going and you'll learn as you go and you'll learn what be works best in your garden and what doesn't. And the only way to do that is to just get personal experience and just start growing. Yep. I totally agree. And um, I'm doing that right now, not with a garden, but I got honeybees this year Ooh. and I learned a little bit about them before I got them, but I knew that I would learn way more having them. And I'm going through that same process right now. It's like, I'm learning stuff every single day about it, oh, but fun. I wouldn't have known that unless I got my hands in there. Yeah. So yeah, there's, there's just, yeah, exactly. There's just something about, you need to have to do a little bit of basic research and then you just got to dive in honestly. So that's yep. exciting though, that you got honeybees. Yay. Yeah. They're fun. There's, there's a lot to them though. <laughs> yeah. I haven't dived into them yet. There is a lot to them. We, I do mason bees to help for pollinating wise. Obviously I don't get a honey crop on them because they're, they're not a honeybee. So, uh, my hat off to you. You're a step ahead of me there. Yep. Like I said, they're a lot of fun. Um, and then my final question to you is what do you do every single day to keep yourself healthy? Oh, that is such a good question. I love it. Um, I have to say the one thing that I try to do every day to keep myself healthy is some quiet time. So just some time where like right now I can go out and spend it in the garden during the winter months. That doesn't always usually happen, but just taking some time, even if it's just like 10 or 15 minutes uh, to, to decompress, um, to unplug, uh, for me, maybe it's, you know, reading, reading some scripture, it's some time in prayer, and maybe it's prayer out in the garden or just kind of just walking through the plants and time where I'm not actually like working in the garden. So there's a little bit of a difference there, which working in the garden can be very therapeutic. I have worked through some issues weed in a garden, let me tell you. But just just the quietness of not have of not being work and not actually doing something, but just kind of walking through and enjoying the plants and just kind of being there um, and just being restful, which might sound kind of weird. I don't know. But I found that if I do that, then I'm a lot better able to handle and respond in a gracious manner to all the other things that may crop up throughout a day. Awesome. Well, people can find you at melissaknorris.com. You've also mentioned um, your books a couple of times. Do you want to talk about your books and your podcast? Yeah. So the Pioneer Today podcast is where I share all the things uh, about growing your own food and creating a homemade life. So from making, you know, homemade soap to canning and jams and jellies and, and pickles and curing, like we were talking about today, doing all those kinds of things. And then uh, my book, The Family Garden Plan, just came out this January with talk about 
timing, had no idea that, you know, obviously none of us did that, that COVID would be happening when, when I was writing the book. Um, but it's the family garden plan and it, and it shares how to grow a year's worth of sustainable and healthy food. So all the way from the planning stage to seed starting to actually planting and then companion planting, crop rotation, but all broken down for a backyard gardener. So not like huge scale agriculture uh, with charts. Um, and it's all from like a natural organic. So if you've got uh, issues going on with your your plants, different methods there on, on how to deal with them. Uh, yes, slug and snail picking by hand is an organic method. <laughs> as gross as that one sounds, uh, it's probably, probably the worst one that you'll go to. But also like how you know when something is ready to be harvested, because oftentimes... Uh, we go to the store and we see things that are on this on the you know the produce shelf. But if you've never grown it yourself, you're like, oh goodness, like how do I know when this is actually ready to harvest? Or like with the curing tip to harvest this and leave the stem on. Um, and so we've got charts in there that whack you through that, as well as like how much fresh produce, like how many cups of strawberries, for example, actually equals a pint if I want to can or freeze this. Um, and in case you're wondering, it's six to eight cups of fresh strawberries is going to equal one quart or two pints of canned strawberries once they're processed. Um, so anyways, that book is out uh, wherever books are sold. And if you go to familygardenplan.com, I actually have my publisher let me put up for free, which has been awesome, the planning and then the worksheets on how much to plant per person for a year's worth of food. And that includes both your perennial fruits as well as what we would think of as a regular uh, vegetable garden. So you can get those worksheets for free and have those. Perfect. Awesome. Thank you so much, uh, Melissa. Uh, there's a ton of really good information in here, and I'm sure your book is going to have 15 times more in there. So uh, people should run out and get that book, especially now that we are in the gardening season, right? We got to get stuff into the ground. So thank you again for coming onto the show. I appreciate it. Oh, thank you. It was a lot of fun. So are you ready to grow your own garden or have you already started yours this year? Hopefully you get your hands dirty and start to see what you can grow at your own home. I love being able to go out and grab fresh plants to add into our meals, and it just makes the food taste so much better. So make sure to head over to the show notes at summitforwellness.com slash 114 to get all the links to her book and podcast. And she also has her organic garden workshop that you can join, which you can find at summitforwellness.com slash gardening 101. And did you know that we have our very own store with different herbal support for the body? We have different teas for adrenal support, immune support, and even as a sleep aid, and other tinctures available as well. Everything in the store utilizes what nature has to offer, just in more potent forms. So head on over to mountainsideherbals.com to learn more. Next week, Reed Davis is coming onto the show, so let's see what Reed will be teaching us. I am here with Reed Davis. Hey, Reed, what is one unique thing about you that most people don't know? Well, I'm actually a gardener. You know, I, I um, love doing artistic gardening. I create these vignettes all over my property and I play with plants. And I don't know all the names of them and things like that, but I know what I like to look at. And I put little figurines and little things like that. And it's very artistic. And hardly anyone would know that. <laughs> so that's a different than like gardens where you would like grow your own food with? It's more visual? Oh, yeah. It's just a form of art artwork and expression and uh it's my hobby i've planted two thousand plants on my property <laughs> wow that's a lot of plants well what will we be learning about in our interview together well we're going to talk about uh contributors to metabolic chaos so you know it's the underlying health problem uh, I've told you before, I'm, I'm, I was in the environmental business. So I take a very holistic environmental approach to health and restoring a healthy host. So we'll talk a little bit about parasites, bacteria, fungus, virus, and other contributors to metabolic chaos. But it's really the host that matters most. And what are your favorite foods or nutrients that you think everyone should get more of in their diet? Aha. Uh -huh. Well, look at food as macronutrients. There's protein, fat, and carbs, and that there's a right fuel mixture for you. So the answer to your question is get get the fuel mixture 
right proteins fats and carbs and there's actually a scientific way to figure that out it's called your oxidative rate and so you got to get the fuel mixture right and when it comes to which proteins which fats and which carbs that's a whole nother uh area of study combined together but you do need vitamins minerals antioxidants essential fatty acids trace elements and and so on and so on and so uh, phytonutrients and what have you so but start with your macronutrient ratios and get that right you know obviously we eat a lot of carbs and, and, and crap in this country but get get the you know high quality nutrient dense foods get the ratios right then worry about which ones and what you might need to supplement with later and what are your top three health tips for anyone who wants to improve their overall wellness <laughs> Hey, you better start off each day with the right point of view, you know, and if you're a cup is half empty person, well, just, just change that. Just start getting up every day and telling yourself, you know, the cup is half full, the cup is half full. It's, it's going to be a beautiful day. You got to look on the bright side. You have to teach your subconscious to feed you something of value, you know, at least this point of view. You'll get more work done. You'll be happier. You have more joy in your life when you do that. I'm going to say get more done. So that's tip number one is just to wake up each day with a, a good attitude. And if you don't have one, stay at the opposite, you know, say it out loud. And, uh, you know, I do it with my feet um, flat on the dirt outside my my uh, uh, living room window, you know, like, or patio. Um, I do it every day. Uh, number two is then to almost immediately, you know, and I do that with a cup of coffee. That's fine. It's been a couple minutes in reflection like that. Uh, and then I go do something useful. Uh, it could be just get dressed or make my bed, I try to make my bed every day, you know, and that leads to doing the next thing and the next thing. So I'm doing something constructive or useful. And um, then I work really hard. You know, I work hard every day. I start usually at four in the morning. I go to bed quite early. Um, but if I start at five, that's fine. Or even as late as six, to me, that's that's a late start. But um, I usually get a lot done for work. Now, then I spend two hours every day outside. I just told you what my hobby is. Now, I'm also, I have a property and I'm clearing brush and I'm, I'm burning, you know, I do these burnt and stuff and I do it myself and I have to fight off the rattlesnakes and, you know, things like that but um it's really remarkable if you sp can spend at least an hour if not two, i try to spend two hours a day outside and doing doing hard physical labor now that for you could be um you know walking or running i have a, a, a acreage and it's attached to um a preserve there's a 250 acre preserve right next to me that no one ever goes on it's like my own preserve and and i do hikes i make trails and i um i just have fun doing that and again clearing brush is incredibly hard physical labor so you get really strong you get a lot of enjoyment and you can you know process all the crap you know so i would say getting up and changing your point of view doing something useful right away even if it's just making your bed and washing the dishes or something um then you have to work. Everyone has to work, I think. Um, but I spend, I make sure I get that outdoor time. 